My name's Elaine Alford. I'm an architect by profession and I work for Red Row Home Southwest as their design manager. Before joining Red Row, I spent a couple of years with Persimmon Homes Wessex as their architectural development manager. So the two roles are very similar. So effectively heading up the in-house design team, so delivering planning applications and working with the technical teams to make sure that what is actually constructed fits with what's been approved. Prior to joining the house builder ranks, I worked in private practice and as a consultant for many years. Having worked on lots of different projects over the years, everything from single story extensions all the way through to stadiums. Um, but I've always gone back to housing. Housing is really important to me because we live in the built environment. Everyone lives in a house. We take them for granted. And if we don't make good places for people to live, then we are doing a great disservice. So I suppose for me, it's my first true love, and that is why I work for a house builder, because that's what they do, they build houses. Housing in architectural terms has always sort of been seen as the poor cousin. No one really wants to do it, and quite a lot of my peers will say, why are you doing housing? Why do you work for a house builder? But it really is what I love to do, and I think that good design pays dividends. So I thought, if I'm in from the inside, I can help change things. My presentation is um, about ideas for today and tomorrow and working with the design review panel is really important to me as well. So first things first, let's get the maths over and done with. There are approximately what 12,000 registered house builders in the UK and they deliver 80% of all the housing delivered across the country. The rest will be small local businesses, homeowners, etc., etc. We often think of housing delivery as something that's done en masse across the, the, the country, but it does include these one off sites. It does include little sites of one to five, 10 to 15, medium sized sites, as well as the really, really big ones, the urban extensions, um, where we're talking into the thousands and thousands of new homes. We have, of course, been set government targets. Um, we have to deliver, apparently, a million new homes by 2020. The health of the economy has also been linked to housing delivery. And it's important to us all, whether we realise it or not. So the government and the planning system, so the MPPF, is supposedly behind us in delivering this housing, this, these additional numbers that we need, and making it quicker and easier to build houses. However, on a day-to-day -day basis, the reality is somewhat different for the rest of us. Um, in recent years, it seems to be becoming more and more difficult to deliver housing, to get those planning applications through the system, to get those officers on board. We are somewhat shy of building the 250,000 houses we need every year. 2016, we delivered 180,000. So you can see there's a big discrepancy there. And in recent years, to add to that, government has cut local authority budgets. So planning teams have reduced in size, which seems counterintuitive because we need more officers on the ground making those decisions quicker so we can deliver. Lack of resources and time scales often lead to determination periods running and that mission creep sets in. And the whole process slows down from the planning process all the way through to the construction and delivery process. So therefore we are not meeting our targets. But there is some good news. Year on year, we have increased um, what we are delivering. Um, in the last three years, productivity has gone up by about 50 odd percent. And the average man on the street, however, doesn't necessarily appreciate what we have to deal with every day. He looks at the site next door that's just about to go into planning or the site that's been built on and he looks at it with dismay. He doesn't want it in his back garden. But what he doesn't realise is that the housing industry has a huge impact on the economy of 
the country, and it has significant benefits for us all. So I'm just going to go through this slide, really. So there are some massive numbers there up here. Um, so I thought I'll just break that down a little. So I went into the HBF calculator and looked at what 100 new homes delivers. So 430 jobs supported, whether that's in the construct construction industry, the brick factor, the delivery man, or the lady and man that come in, hoover the floors, do the windows, do the gardening before the purchaser arrives. Public open spaces are delivered. Gardens are provided, and that benefit is four and a half thousand trees, plants and shrubs planted on that 100 unit scheme. Affordable housing. Nationally, we deliver circa 38% affordable housing across all the units delivered. So on our 100 scheme, we've created 23. It depends on what local authority you're in as to what percentage you provide. Infrastructure is built and improved on, so roads, bridges, cycleways, trams, all the rest of it. It's all improved by Section 106 contributions to add to the community facilities, the schools, um, and the wider benefits we all see. But even more than that, the tax revenues generated are huge, both tax revenues to government and in council taxes. So when you add up and multiply up your 100 homes over the 180,000 delivered in the year, you can see the numbers are really big. Let's just look at the tax revenue, circa 1.4 billion pounds given to government by the house building industry because we deliver housing. That is very much overlooked, in my opinion. Why do we build houses? Why do house builders build houses? It sounds like a really, really silly question, but it's not. There are a num number of reasons why we build houses. We have government targets, local targets to meet. Do we build them because we want to provide local communities vibrant places for people to live, create attractive places, homes for people? Or is it, a, is it a economics? Is it called hard cash? Well, I think all of you in the room know the reason we're here. It is because of called hard cash. It is a business. Um, we do it very well. That's what house builders do. They build and sell houses. And by golly, we're very, very successful at it. Forget what the board wants us to do. All over the country, there are regional teams of people in house, in house building, and external consultant teams that are working really, really hard to deliver fantastic places for people to live. They're creating good quality homes for all. They're integrating uh, efficient design principles and developing great places for people to live. They really care about what they do. They're providing sustainable local communities um, and again, maximizing profits, which is ultimately what we want to do. Historically though, house builders have been given a really bad reputation. You saw some previous slides earlier today. Bad design <coughs> is noticed, but good design is often taken for granted. But bad design can have really serious implications on people's lives and the quality of their mental and physical well-being. So why is bad design so unsuccessful? And why is good design unseen? And why is it so hard to get right? It's hard to get right because we all take it for granted. We take it for granted that it's easy to deliver good design, good housing, good places for people to live. It's very, very challenging at times. The collection of photographs on the screen, I think, beautifully demonstrate what we try not to do. They deliver dead spaces. They deliver unsustainable communities. Crime and fear of crime goes through the roof, through lack of natural surveillance, alleyways, spaces that do nothing, no one loves them, no one cares. And ultimately, it does affect sites next door. 
It does affect sales. It affects profits. Thankfully, these very bad examples very rarely make it to the planning application stage and are offered as solutions these days because actually customers and local authorities and ward members and committee members are getting a bit more savvy. They're tuned in to what good design can do and they recognise the pitfalls not only to the urban environment but to the people that live in those dwellings as well. And let's face it, no one wants to buy a house in that street. We as house builders, what do we have to do? We have to balance all these things, all the aspirations that we find every day. And we work within a set of rules. And we have a lot of hoops to jump through. So what do we have to ask ourselves? So what does the LPA want? What do the purchasers want? But before we even get to that, we have a myriad of group aspirations and expectations to meet, as well as the physical constraints of the site. There are no easy sites anymore. Each one will be challenging and difficult on the ground, but we also have a target number of dwellings per acre to meet. We have plotting densities to achieve. We have target coverage that is set quite often by group against the, the net developable area. We have a seals mix that we get that quite often isn't perhaps right for the site. We have sometimes plotting conventions that we need to work with, again, delivered by group. We need to maximise the development area, so maximising the densities, minimising lost land. So what's the POS requirements? Cut it to the bone. That's all you get. And we need to minimise the build programme and, and also the costs associated with building them. And that would hopefully maximise profit margin. But we need to do all this with standard product. That probably sends ripples of horror through the audience. But unfortunately, the word standard has always seen negatively. Um, it's something that is seen to be substandard and won't deliver good urban design deli um, solutions. As an architect who spent most of my career working on housing, I feel really differently about standard house types. I'd like all of us to be a little bit more celebratory of the work that goes into the standard house type design and less apologetic. Standard house types are designed to be efficient they function really well externally and internally. They maximise speed of construction. And there are whole teams of people sitting in regional offices up and down the country. That's what they do. They design standard house types. <coughs> and they design them to, to meet the criteria of what group want, but they also design them to suit urban design principles. Each developer will have their own set of standard house types. That in, in itself makes them non-standard because no two developers will have the same criteria of what they want and what, what their buyers want. So we've had, I've had a lot of uh, experience with some local authorities seeing the word standard house type or developer and panicking that we won't deliver good urban design solutions. But we do. And we can, because this portfolio of house types that we have, quite often there's one to suit every urban design challenge that we meet. We just need to use them in a way that suits. It doesn't mean that the overall design will be substandard. Um, and it doesn't mean that we can't design things to a good level of urban design. In fact, urban design principles themselves are standard. We all want the same thing. We think about active streets, we want good public open space, we want connectivity, and we want <coughs> visual uh, stop ends, we want vistas. Those are all standard things within design, so why can't we use standard products successfully? Well, it, in my experience, we can. They can be dressed up or down, we can make them contextually comfortable, or we can use them to provide very distinct character. So they function well on lots of different levels. So 
My advice to any local authority bodies in the room is to celebrate them and not fear them so much because we can use them to deliver good design. That brings me on to why would house builders use Southwest Design Review Panel service and why am I on it? Um, I'm on it because I'm an architect and I felt that working for a house builder was really important and therefore putting my point of view across a design review panel when schemes came up that were relevant was important because I do understand the economics and the KPIs and the group expectations that we have to deal with and I understand standard product but I also understand design and I think that's what the panel does. The panel is very good at doing that. It offers you <coughs> expertise. Bearing in mind this is a time when local government cuts and the planning periods are becoming longer and perhaps more onerous, onerous and challenging. Sometimes the quality of the feedback we get from pre-app isn't as good as we fear or we think it could be. And sometimes <coughs> it's just rather interesting, for want of a better word. So what does DRP offer? Jonathan has spoken about it earlier. It offers independent people. We're all experts in the field because we do a day job. This is what we do. You have a myriad of experts, everybody from engineers, architects, landscape architects, all the way through the suite of professionals that make up the urban design team. So we understand the economics of it, of business, because we are in business, we all function in day jobs. We understand the group constraints faced by design teams across, across the country, but we also understand the planning system because we do that too. We're involved in that as well as part of our everyday jobs. We're independent, we're transparent. We offer guidance and a conversation. We bounce around ideas at Design Review Panel. So it's not a one-way street, it's a conversation, it's not a diktat. Quite often, Design Review Panel is about finding and honing the solutions and offering good advice where we can. It's not about redesigning your scheme just because we can. It's not about that, it's about good urban design solutions. It's real advice. Um, and there is a specific time frame for getting the advice back to you. And sometimes, again, that can be what lets pre-planning application down, is trying to get that advice back. Because officers are busy, there are less of them on the ground, and that quite often is not their fault. That's government cuts, um, and there are just less bodies around. It's real advice. Um, it's always delivered in plain English in the report rather than flowery architectural speak that actually really doesn't mean anything or can be misconstrued or reinterpreted in four different ways. Um, so that's what we do as a design review service. What would be the benefits of coming to design review panel and what does it deliver to you? Quite simply, we can help deliver good design. We can help you deliver good design, which Sounds very simple, but sometimes sounds very expensive, but good design doesn't have to be expensive. And when balanced against the benefits, it's quite often a no-brainer. The advice stretches across scheme design. It, ass it assesses the urban design principles being employed on that particular site, and it offers advice, advice on improvement if required. What it does look at is whether your scheme is efficient, whether the houses that are you using out of your portfolio were in the right place, and have you got another one that perhaps you need on that corner or on that street, or it, does it work for you? Is there anything we can add? Um, good design does deliver communities with distinct characters and identities, or it's contextually comfortable. Sustainable, balanced communities where connectivity and wayfinding is easy, create desirable places to live. You'll see some fantastic examples on the board there from all over the southwest, some very modern and some more traditional and 
I think that one in the corner is the, is the Code 6 one at Hannam Hall. It doesn't have to be a challenge. Space has become more integrated and it's easier to find your way around. People are less dependent upon cars. So again, more sustainable communities. The social and economic benefits really do speak for themselves. Good design can also help speed up your planning processes because it is a material consideration when you go to design review panel. We can make, help you with making healthy place, places to live, safer streets, so design out fear of crime and crime, make it active, make it wanted, include everyone in the process, provide public open spaces that are connected to the wider landscaping. So bring schemes to us early. That, I think, is the biggest thing we can try and push forward. Bring them early whilst it's a blobogram, whilst it's a thought in your head, and let the conversation start. Because the earlier you get the scheme in front of the design review panel, the earlier we can help you with it. And it doesn't have to cost you numbers on your scheme. Quite often we will tell you where we think densities need to be higher or lower. It, it doesn't have to cost you numbers and it certainly doesn't have to cost you coverage. What does all this achieve? Hopefully quicker planning determinations because we have a time frame, we needed to get it to you and then that is a material consideration. So that should hopefully help officers make an informed decision. It should hopefully help us increase on the last three years performance for housing delivery. So we're up by 52% in the last three years. Let's see if we can increase that. We need to increase that to hit government targets. We'll give you clear and concise advice. We'll be very, very helpful. It's a good thing to do. It is a conversation. We'll give you practical, economical, econ economically viable, sorry, and holistic su suggestions. We do a day job. We do it very well and design review panel is something additional to that and we are using our expertise to help you deliver your schemes so that's got to be a celebration as well and you will get that significant added value back. You'll provide your schemes, you'll build them out um, and you will create places that are desirable for people to live in. It will enhance the field next door or the site next door, or the neighbourhood next door, and it goes on in perpetuity. These dwellings are going to be up for a long, long time. We see that in Victorian streets. They're still there. I live in a Victorian house. It's probably going to be there for an awful, lot, an awful long time, as are these units that we are building today. So what does that equate to? Ultimately, it equates to increased sales demand, because you've created very good quality design, somewhere where people really want to live. They, they want to live there. Your sales rates will increase because the demand is there. You will increase your profits and your revenues because your sales prices will be higher. So incorporating design review panel <coughs> information into your scheme can actually offer opportunities and increase your economic values on the site that you have in front of you rather than cost you money. So good design is achievable on your budget to meet your coverage, to meet your unit numbers, and it doesn't have to cost you the earth and we should not fear it. That's what today is about, design review panel, helping you achieve and your sites achieve the potential that they have through having a conversation. Um, and hopefully that will speed things up in the planning process and help your build program accelerate. And let's see if we can't meet some of those government targets that we've been so nicely set. And that's it. <laughs>